Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have uh, the 5th of February 2018, still young in this new year, even though biblically, biblically the new year starts in end of March, beginning of April. Yeah, just checking if the recording is running. Yeah, that's good. Um, today I've come to the table to read the next part, which is part 19 of the Secret History of the Jesuits. And um, this book is coming to a conclusion, you would think. No, 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 far, far away. I haven't uh, done a recording last week because I was sick. I really have a very bad cold. Still, you probably hear that a little bit with my voice. And I'm sorry for that, but uh, I really was out of condition to do any recordings last week and therefore I couldn't continue, but of course I continued reading in the book The Secret History of the Jesuits, and after a few pages what I was reading here, I did some research on the NDH, the satellite uh, state of Croatia of the Second World War between 1941 and 1945, and a little bit about the Eustachy, and I came across a, an interesting website, and I copied that into a PDF, and it's about 19 pages, including a few pictures, and I will include that in the reading. I don't know if that will be this reading or the next one, because now, for the moment, we are going to start here to read on page 145 in the PDF. Uh, as you can see, uh, the next thing, or this thing that we are still busy with, is dealing with the Infernal Cycle, still the same name, and um, it deals with the German aggressions and the Jesuits, in Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. And last time then when I took off, we were already speaking about Yugoslavia. And that is also, of course, the part where the Eustachy will come uh, in the, uh, in, into play. Okay? So, um, we are going to read from the wonderful book that Edmund Perez gave us, The Secret History of the Jesuits, and we will learn much, much more about the Second World War right now. I'm going to continue exactly where I left off last time. I don't even have to go back. You can do that for your own when you have a copy to read on your own next to my reading here, because we don't really miss something. To comprehend the full extent of that collaboration, one must read the Croatian Catholic Press, the Katolici Cecnik, the Catholic List, the Hrvatsky Narod, and so many other publications, which viewed, which, uh, which vied with each other in flattering the bloody Proglavnik. Uh, Proglavnik is a word that stands for the first man, the first person, the chief, the Führer, the leader. Uh, Proglavnik. Pius XII was so pleased that he was a practicing Catholic and the high esteem of the sovereign pontiff embraced even the accomplices of that of the great man. The Osservatore Romano, that is a publication of the Jesuits themselves from Rome, that you know because we've mentioned that before. The Osservatore Romano informs us that on the 22nd of July 1941, the Pope received 100 members of the Croatian security police, led by the chief of Zagreb's police, Eugen Kvaternik Dido. This group of Croatian SS, the pick of the executioners and torturers operating in the concentration camps, were presented to the Holy Father, quote unquote Holy Father, the Antichrist, by one who perpetrated crimes so monstrous that his own mother committed suicide in despair. The goodwill of... <laughs> I don't even try to dare to read this, but... You know, this is the title and this is just in this book, so... Huh? The goodwill of His Holiness, Antichrist Pope Pius XII, is easily explained by the apostolic zeal of these killers. Another practicing Catholic, Bile Budak, Minister for Worship, exclaimed in, nine, in August 1941 at Karlovac the following. First I will get a picture of... Uh, Budak, and then we are going to read what this Budak, do you see here in this picture, in Karlovac in August 1941, exclaimed, quote, 
the Eustachy movement is based on religion. All our work rests on our loyalty to religion and the Catholic Church. Unquote. So, more clear, you could not be to lay the relation between the atrocities of the genocide in Yugoslavia done by the Ustashi and the Roman Catholic Church. It is from the horse's mouth itself here. Besides, the author continues, on the 22nd of July at Gospic, the same minister for worship, Bulak, a Budak, had perfectly defined this work. Quote, we will kill some Serbians, deport others, and the rest will be compelled to embrace the Roman Catholic religion. Unquote. So in other words, he says, we will start a genocide, we will start deportation, and we will the rest leave to convert or die. This quote-unquote fine program was carried out to the letter. When the liberation put an end to this tragedy, 300,000 Serbians and Jews had been deported and more than 500,000 have been massacred. By this means, the Roman Catholic Church had also made 240,000 Orthodox believers enter its fold, who quickly went back to the religion of their ancestors when their freedom was restored. So this convert or die is a conversion only for a short matter of time. Because at the moment that the pressure from the Roman Catholic Church is gone, people go back to their basic beliefs. But to obtain this ridiculous result, what horrors fell on that unfortunate country? One must read in the book of Evre Laurier, Assassins in the Name of God, details of the monstrous tortures that these practicizing Catholics who were the Ostashis inflicted on their poor victims. The English journalist G. A. Voigt wrote, quote, Croatian politics consisted of massacres, deportations or conversions. The number of those who were massacred reaches hundreds of thousands. The massacres were accompanied by the most bestial tortures. The Eustachis put out their victims' eyes and made garlands with them, which they wore or presented as mementos." Unquote. In Croatia, the Jesuits implanted political clericalism. Yeah. <laughs> what is political clericalism? That is the combination of state and church. It is the present invariably offered by the famous company the company of Jesus, to the nations which welcome it. The same author adds, quote, With the death of, great, of the great Croatian tribune Radic, Croatia loses its main opponent to political clericalism, which will embrace the mission of the Catholic action defined by Friedrich Muckermann. And here we have a picture of Friedrich Muckermann. He was a priest in the society of Jesus. This German Jesuit, Friedrich Muckermann, well known before Hitler's advent, made it known in 1928 in a book whose foreword was written by Monsignor Pacelli, then Apostolic Nuncio in Berlin. <laughs> so, <laughs> Eugenio Pacelli, who was Apostolic or Papal Nuncio in, in Germany between 1917 and 1929, wrote a foreword to the Jesuit book from Friedrich Muckermann in 1928. Muckermann expressed himself as follows, quote, The Pope appeals in favor of the Catholic action's new crusade. Do I need to say more? Do I really need to make a comment on this? The Pope appeals in favor of the Catholic action's new crusade. In other words, Muckermann expressed himself in the same way as George W. Bush expressed himself in 2001. Also speaking of a crusade, right? But Muckermann probably even a little bit more clear than George W. Bush did. He is the guide, speaking about the Pope, who carries the standard of Christ's kingdom. 
the Catholic action means the gathering of world Catholicism. It must live its heroic age. The new epoch can be acquired for Christ only through the price of blood. Unquote. The new epoch, well, understand the new epoch as the new age or as the new world order, can be acquired for Christ, yeah, the Christ of the Roman Catholic Church, Satan, only through the price of blood. Because it is said that without the shedding of blood no man is saved. But the Jesuits, who follow that rule, killing everybody, forget by that that Jesus Christ shed his blood already for all of us. This new epoch can be acquired for Christ only through the price of blood. Jesus Christ paid it already all, and this new world order can only be acquired for Satan through the price of blood of the saints and the martyrs of the Bible, meaning Bible-believing Protestant Christians, like me and so many like you out there, who are not going to or not willing to go along with the new world order agenda, which is the old world order restored. No? Ten years after this was written, the one who wrote the foreword and the Jesuit Father Muckerman's book sat on the throne of St. Peter, and during his pontificate, the blood for Christ literally flowed in Europe. But Croatia suffered the worst of the atrocities deeds of the atrocious deeds of that new epoch, of that new age. There, not only were the priests advocating all-out slaughter from the pulpit, but some even marched at the head of the murderers. Others held, apart from their sacred ministry, official posts at, as prefects or chiefs of the Eustachi police, even as chiefs of concentration camps, where honors were not outdone by even Dachau or Auschwitz. To this bloody list of honors we must enter the names of the Abbe Bosida Bralo, the priest Dragutin Kamber, the Jesuit Lakovic and the Abbe Ivan Salic, secretaries to Monsignor Stepinak, the priest Nicholas Belokrovic, etc., etc., etc. And numberless Franciscans, yeah, you know, the Franciscans, uh, monk order from the Roman Catholic Church, one of the worst of these was Brother Miroslav Filipovic, and I have a picture of him right here. Miroslav Filipovic in Jasenovac concentration camp. This is the photo. This is why there's Jenson uh, Jasenovaci standing here. This is the concentration camp that he was in. One of the worst of these was quote-unquote brother Miroslav Filipovic, main organizer of those massacres, chief of and executioner at the concentration camp of Jasenovac, the most hideous of these earthly hells. And I also have a picture of the concentration camp of Jasenovac. Brother Filipovic's fate was the same as Monsignor Tiso's in Slovakia. When liberation came, he was hanged wearing his cassock. But many of his rivals, not very anxious to win the palm of the martyr, fled to Austria, pell-mell with the assassins they had assisted so well. But what was the hierarchy doing when confronted with the bloodthirsty frenzy of so many of its subordinates? The hierarchy, or the episcopate and its leaders, Monsignor Stepinak voted in the Ustashi parliament for the decrees concerning the conversion of the orthodox to Catholicism, sent missionaries to the terrorized peasants, converted without wincing whole villages, took possession of the Serbian orthodox church's properties, and without ceasing showered praises and blessings on the Poglavnik, copying the example set from on high by Antichrist Pope Pius XII, Eugenio Percelli. I don't like to say it, so I put it in quotation marks. Uh, between quotation marks, His Holiness, Antichrist Pope Pius XII, 
was personally represented at Zagreb by an eminent monk, the R.P. Marconi. And there we have a picture of him also. This is the Catholic Archbishop Stepinac, here in black on the left, and Papal Nuncio Marconi, here on the right, in white, and a Nazi general in the back of them. This Sancti Sedis Legatos, which means Holy See's Ambassador, speaking about Marconi, the Cardinal, uh, um, was given the place of honor at all the ceremonies of the Eustachi regime and had himself sanctimoniously photographed at the home of the chief of killers, Pavelic, with his family which received him as a friend, birds of a feather flock together. So the most sincere cordiality always reigned in the relations between the assassins and the ecclesiastics. Of course, many of the ecclesiastics held both positions, for which they were never blamed. The end justifies the means, we know that motto of the Jesuits very well. When Pervelic and his 4,000 Ustashis, which included Archbishop uh, Sarek, who is in the picture right here, Archbishop Sarek, a Jesuit, Bishop Garrick and 400 clerics left the scene of their exploits to go first to Austria, then on to Italy. They left behind part of their treasures, films, photographs, recorded speeches of anti pervelage chests full of jewels, gold coins, gold and platinum from the teeth, bracelets, wedding rings and pieces of dentures made of gold and platinum. This spoil, taken from the poor wretches who had been murdered, were hidden at the Archiescopical uh, Archie, uh, Palace, where they were eventually found. As for the fugitives, they took advantage of the, political, uh, of the Pontifical uh, Commission um, for... Uh, Sorry, sorry. I, yeah, I was I was reading here already in the in the screen part. I uh, shouldn't have done that. Uh, as for the fugitives, they took advantage of the Pontifical Commission for assistance created expressly to save war criminals. This charitable institution hid them in convents, mainly in Austria and Italy, and provided the chiefs with false passports, which enabled them to go to friendly countries, which. Um, where they would be able to enjoy the fruits of their robberies in peace. This was done for anti Pavelic, whose presence in Argentina was revealed in 1957 through an attempt upon his life in which he was wounded. So, there's a picture of uh, anti Pavelic of, ah yeah, the book The Real Odessa. This is a book that I bought some time ago. Because this book deals, as you can see, how Peron brought in Nazi war criminals to Argentina. And it doesn't deal only with German war criminals. No, 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 no. It deals with Italian, it deals with Eustachi, Croatian war criminals. It deals, of course, with also with German war criminals. Yeah? And therefore I made this uh, little comment here. I said, for more information on these facts which I just read here, yeah, that this was done for anti Pavelic, that he could flee to Argentina, where his presence was revealed in 1957. If you want more information, turn to the book of Ukigoni, The Real Odessa, a great research book on how Peron brought Nazi war criminals to Argentina. And I'm going to announce this right here. I will include chapter 3 of that book later into the reading of this book. When will that later be? Well, Let's have a little look. Uh, I think... Oh no, this was not it. Uh, here we have the, uh, the content. And I think that I will include this chapter 3 of the real Odessa in the reading when it, it deals with chapter 6, Death Camps and Anti-Semitic Crusade. Somewhere in there. I, I took a note there, um, but I'm not going there right now because 
we are going to read this book right here. But I'm going to announce to you that next to the paper that I found on the NDH state, which I will include in another reading of this secret history of the Jesuits, that is this here, the Vatican rule in the Eustacia genocide, this paper I will read to you. Next to that I will also read chapter 3 of the real Odessa. It is a groundbreaking book for someone who has not known of these things or who maybe has heard of Operation Paperclip but has no idea what it was all about and that there also were the Vatican red lines and this is actually what the real Odessa deals about. Yeah? So this meaning the shipping to friendly countries was done for Ante Pavelic after the war, whose presence in Argentina was revealed in 1957 through an attempt upon his life in which he was wounded. Since then, the dictatorial regime collapsed in Buenos Aires. Um, like former President Perón himself, his protégé had to leave Argentina. From Paraguay, you remember the reductions of Paraguay? I read earlier in this book. From Paraguay, where he first where he went first, he reached Spain where he died on the twenty eighth of december nineteen fifty nine at the German hospital of Madrid. On that occasion the French press recalled his bloody career and, more discreetly, the powerful accomplices who enabled him to escape punishment. Under the title, Belgrade demanded his extradition in vain, we read in Le Monde, that is a French newspaper of the time, and even existing today, quote, The brief information published in the press this morning revived, amongst the Yugoslav people, souvenirs of a past filled with sufferings and bitterness towards those who, by hiding anti Pavelic for nearly 15 years, obstructed the course of justice. Unquote. Paris Press points out the last shelter offered to the terrorists with this short but significant phrase, quote, he ended up in a Franciscan monastery of Madrid. So, even then he wasn't apprehended, he wasn't put into prison, he mo ended up in a monastery, in a Franciscan monastery in Madrid after being released from the hospital. It is from there, in fact, that Pavelic was taken to hospital where he paid his debt to nature, but not to justice, scoffed at by these powerful accomplices who are easy to identify. Monsignor Stepinak, who had, as he said, a clear conscience, stayed in Zagreb where he was tried in 1946. Condemned to hard labor, he was in fact only made to, resi to reside in his native village. The penance was easy to bear, as we can see, but the church needs martyrs. The Archbishop of Zagreb was then made a member of the Holy Cohort in his lifetime by Antichrist Pope Pius XII, who hastened to confer him, uh, on him the title of Cardinal in recognition of his apostolate, which displays the purest brightness. There we go to the picture of Stepinak, the next one, which is here as Cardinal Aloysius Stepinak, that war criminal who is responsible for the genocide of one million people at least in the satellite state of Croatia. He is then in his lifetime by Pius XII made Cardinal in recognition of his apostolate, which displays the purest brightness. That's what the Roman Catholic Church, Church calls the Inquisition, calls genocide, torture, murder on innocent men, women and children. An apostolate of the purest brightness. We are acquainted with the symbolic meaning of the Cardinal's purple. The one who dons it must be ready to confess his faith, usque ad sanguinis effusionem, to the point of shedding blood. We cannot deny that this shedding was abundant in Croatia during the apostolate of this holy man, quote unquote, holy man, 
but the blood which flowed there in torrents was not the prelates. It was the blood of orthodox believers and Jews and gypsies and protestants, I might add. Must we see there a reversibility of merits? In the mind of every normal thinking man, you can only become a martyr when you are giving your own blood. In the Roman Catholic Church you can become a martyr when you give the blood of innocent men, women and children. And that's what this little sentence is all about. We cannot deny that this shedding was abundant in Croatia during the apostolate of this holy man, but the blood which flowed there in torrents was not the one of the quote-unquote martyr, the prelate, it was the blood of orthodox believers and Jews and protestants and gypsies. If that is the case, that we have to see here a reversibility of merits, if that is the case, the right to cardinalship of Monsignor Stepinac cannot even be contested. In the diocese of Gorny Karlovac, part of his archbishopric, out of 460,000 Orthodox people who lived there, 50,000 were able to hide in the mountains, 50,000 were sent to Serbia, 40,000 were converted to Catholicism through the regime of terror and 280,000 were massacred. This makes you a saint in the Church of Satan. This makes you a martyr in the Church of Satan when you spill the blood of, in this case, 280,000 people. Men, women and children. On the 19th of December 1958 we read in Catholic France, quote, to exalt the greatness and heroism of his eminence, the Cardinal Stepinac, a great meeting will take place on the 21st of December 1958 at 4 o'clock in the crypt of Saint Odile, 2 Avenue Stéphane Malarme, Paris 17. It will be presided over by his eminence, the Cardinal Felton, Archbishop of Paris. Senator Ernest Pezet and Reverend Father Dragoon, National Rector of the Croatian Mission in France, will take part. His Excellency Monsignor Rupp will celebrate Mass and Communion." Unquote. This is how a new figure, and not one of the least important, the one of Cardinal Stepinac, came to enrich the gallery of great Jesuits. Another aim of this meeting on the 21st of December 1958 in the crypt of Saint Odile was to launch a book written in the defense of Zagreb's archbishop by the R.P. Dragoon himself, Monsignor Rupp, co-adjutor of Cardinal Feltin, wrote the foreword. We cannot give here a full analysis, but will say this. The book is entitled The Dossier of Cardinal Stepinac which seems to promise the reader an objective exposition of the trial at Zagreb. In fact, in this volume, which numbers 285 pages, we find the speeches of the Archbishop's two councils in full, accompanied by extensive remarks from the author, but neither the charge itself nor the speech for the, prosecu uh, for the prosecution are mentioned even briefly. The R.P. Dragoon seems to ignore the French proverb qui n'entend qu'une cloche n'entend qu'un son. There are two sides to every story, unless, of course, he knows it too well. Now I translated this French proverb that goes qui n'entend qu'une cloche n'entend qu'un son that says who does not hear that a bell hears only one sound. But that as it may, this systematic obliteration of the opposite side of the story would be enough to close the debate. Let us consider, though, the good reasons invoked for the discharge of Zagreb's archbishop. But first of all, this question. Was Monsignor Stepinac, who we still see here in the picture, really the Metropolitan of Croatia and Slovenia? The book of R.P. Dragoon does not answer this question.
On page 142 of that book we read this concerning the copy of a report by Monsignor Stepinak, the authenticity of which, it was, uh, of which was contested by the defense. Quote, In the text of the copy the Archbishop is described as Metropolitan Croatia et Slovenia. But the Archbishop is not a Metropolitan and never presented himself as such. This would clear the matter up if we didn't read on page 114 the following taken from Monsignor Stepinak's own declarations from his own declarations before the tribunal. Quote, the Holy See often emphasizes that the small nations and the national minorities have the right to be free. Should not I, as bishop and metropolitan, have the right to discuss it? <laughs> so, he gives himself the title of metropolitan there. The more we read, the less we understand. That is sometimes with this Roman Catholic writings. I agree. No matter. As we are reminded again and again, Monsignor Stepina could not influence in any way the behavior of his flock and clergy. To those who bring out the articles of the Catholic press praising the accomplishments of Pavelich and his hired assassins, the answer is, quote, it is simply ridiculous to make Monsignor Stepinak responsible for what the newspaper wrote. Unquote. Even when this paper was the Katolitsky List, the most important Catholic publication in Zagreb, Diocese of Monsignor Stepinak. In those conditions we won't bother mentioning the Andechel Kuvar, the guardian angel, belonging to the Franciscans, the Glasnik Savante, uh, the voice of St. Anthony, to the conventuals of the Katolitsky Tjetjnik, the Catholic Weekly of Sarajevo, Bishop Sarich, nor, of course, the Vjesnik Prokasne Stratze Skra Izuskova which is the publication of the guard of honor of the heart of Jesus belonging to the Jesuits. So it is claimed that Monsignor Stepinak, contested metropolitan, had no influence over these publications, of which he was president and which constantly tried to surpass each other in their adulation of Pavelic and his regime of blood. Neither did he have any authority, so they say, over the Ustashi, over bishops Sakrich, Garich, Aksamovich, Simrak, etc., who showered praise on the Poglavnik and applauded his crimes, nor did he have any power over the crusaders of the Catholic action, these auxiliaries of Ustashi converters, nor over the Franciscan murders, nor over the nuns of Zagreb who marched past, their hands raised in the Hitlerian fashion. What a strange hierarchy which had authority over nothing and nobody. This is a very sarcastic sentence of the author. But what other conclusions can you get to? When Archbishop Stekin, Step, Aloysius Stepinak is the head of the Roman Catholic Church there in Zagreb, in the Eustachy satellite state of Croatia, and he is the editor or responsible for all these different newspapers and magazines and other publications, and he is the head of all the bishops Sakrich, Garic, Aksamovic, etc., etc., and then he washes his hand in water and says, I have nothing to do with this. What a strange hierarchy which had authority over nothing and nobody. If an hierarchy has no authority, it is no hierarchy. But this is the way the Roman Catholic Church played it. Oh yeah, he had the office. Oh yeah, he was there, but he didn't know anything. He didn't know this, he didn't know that, he was not responsible for this, he was not responsible for that. Yeah, he was on the top, but hey, he did not 
execute any authority over anyone or anything. All these people did that by themselves. He was on the top of the pyramid, he was on top of the hierarchy, but oh no, Stepinac is a holy man. He is not responsible for what they did. This is what they tell us. And I hope that we are not that gullible to believe it and to just swallow it. The fact that he sat with, the ten, uh, with ten other Catholic priests in the Sabor, which is the Eustachy Parliament, does not compromise the Archbishop. Or, at least we must presume this as the fact, is simply ignored. We should not reproach him either for his presidency over episcopal conferences, nor over the committee for the application of the decree concerning the conversion of Orthodox people. In this apology, the humanitarian pretext of having made so many enter the Roman Church by force is fully and skillfully expounded. We read this concerning the awful dilemma facing Monsignor Stepinac. Quote, His pastoral duty was to maintain intact the canonical principle, principles, but, on the other hand, Dissidents who refused to embrace Catholicism were massacred, so he lessened the severity of the rules. Unquote. We become even more bewildered when we read a little further on. Quote, he tried to resolve this dramatic alternative in the circulator on the 2nd of March of 1942, in which he ordered the priests to closely screen the motives for conversion. Unquote. This is indeed a peculiar method to attenuate the severity of the rules and resolve the dramatic alternative. Was Monsignor Stepinac opening or shutting the doors of the Roman Church to the false converts? It would be absolutely impossible to find it out if we referred only to this speech for the defense. The Archbishop apologists seem to choose the shutting, though, when they declare, quote, the cases of rebaptisms were very rare in the territory of Zagreb, uh, of Zagreb's archdiocese. Yeah? Unfortunately, statistics tell us otherwise, as we said earlier, quote, in the diocese of Gorni Karlovac alone, part of Zagreb's archbishopric, 40,000 people were rebaptized, And you know, baptized, held under the gun, and the motto, convert or die. Yeah? It is evident that such results could be obtained only through mass conversions of whole villages, such as Kamensko, in that same archdiocese of Monsignor Stepinac, where 400 lost sheep returned to the Roman fold in one day, spontaneously and without any pressure on the part of civil and ecclesiastical authorities. Yeah. Uh, who believes that? Okay, let me see how far am I already. Okay. Then why conceal these numbers? Huh? If they were really due to the charitable sentiments of the Croatian Catholic clergy and not to the cynical exploitation of terror, they should have been proud of them. The truth is that the veil thrown over these infamies is an attempt to hide them uh, in an attempt to hide them is transparent and not wide enough. To cover Stepinac, others have to be uncovered. Bishops Sarik, Garrick, Simrak, the priests Belogrivich, Kambabralo and their associates. The, the Franciscans and Jesuits have to be uncovered. And finally, the Holy See, all to cover for Stepinac. We might as well leave this peculiar archbishop to enjoy his clear conscience. This primate of Croatia, supposedly stripped of any authority, calling himself metropolitan when he wasn't so, and who, to crown the paradox, was opening doors when shutting them. But, 
At the side of this fantastic prelate there was another one, consistent and corpulent, the R.P. Marconi, personal representative of Pope Pius XII. And uh, we have a picture here, of course, of Marconi. This is here, and I'm going to explain this picture to you in a second. Huh? It says here, uh, the papal legate in white, Marconi, here you can see. Archbishop Stekin Stepinak, here in the back. Anti Pavelic, here in Eustache uniform. And his wife, here in front, at the opening of a home for children in Tuscanach. The papal legate Ramiro Marconi, in white in the picture as we've seen. And this is the picture that I just described to you. Yeah. At the side of this fantastic prelate, Archbishop Stepinak, there was another one, consistent and corpulent, the R.P. Marconi. He was the personal representative of Pius XII. In other words, Marconi was the nuncio of that satellite state of Croatia at that time. Now let me see how far we are already in the reading. 41 minutes. Then, okay, I've tried. Um, I, uh, I I told you already in the beginning that we would go uh, into the reading of this paper that I found on the internet. Uh, to go even a little bit deeper into the whole Eustachi and Croatia thing and the Second World War. And we are going to do this right now because I took notes of this year. So this Marconi was the, ho the Holy See's envoy, huh? the nuncio if you want, like this. And um, did I have this, this paper here? Yeah, okay. Now we are going to learn more details on this satanic state, the satanic state of Croatia, this independent state of Croatia during the Second World War. I will include a link for you that you can find on Wikipedia where you can read about this. It was it was a World War II fascist puppet state of Germany and Italy. And we are going to read the Vatican role in the Eustachia genocide. <coughs> Sorry. And this is the paper right here. The Vatican role in the Eustachia genocide in the independent state of Croatia. Roman Catholic Croatian guards at the Jasanovac concentration camp prepare to execute an inmate. This is a photo from the Holocaust Memorial Museum that you can see here. Here is the inmate that is being uh, executed. And this is a photo from the Jasanovac concentration camp. And. Um, Maybe I show you a picture of that again because we put that up here a few pictures ago. This is the Jasenovac concentration camp. This article here is by Carl Savage, to whom all credit, because I took it from the internet site there. What role, if any, did the Vatican play in the genocide committed in the independent state of Croatia, a Roman Catholic state sponsored by the Vatican? This has been a controversial topic regarding World War II histo historiography. Renewed debate was stirred up in 1999 with the publication of Hitler's Pope, The Secret History of Pius XII by John Cornwell. And a lot of that book is taken out, um, a lot of this article that I'm going to read here to you is taken out of that book. Yeah? So I'm just going to look at Hitler's Pope, that I have a picture of the book. That's this one, by John Cornwell. Here you can see, that book was published in 1999. Quite fitting, um, because in the end of the 1990s, Croatia, or Serbia, let's say, again was the target of the Roman Catholic Church, as you probably remember. And why am I reading this document to you, the Vatican role in the Eustachia genocide and the independent state of Croatia during the reading of the secret history of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris? Edmond Paris. Well, because Edmond Paris goes very deep into this and this is more like a little summary that we can get to. And this is why I'm going to read to you now the Vatican role, the Vatican role, the role of the beast 
of Revelation 17 that is written by a woman, the Roman Catholic Church, in the Eustacia genocide in the independent state of Croatia. How about Vatican knowledge? The nature of the Eustacia NDH regime, and the NDH that stands for the uh, independent um, independent state of Croatia, uh, that is in Croat, that is the shortage for that in, in Croatian language. So NDH stands for the independent state of Croatia. The nature of the, nature of the Eustacia NDH regime was well known by the Vatican and by the US government as early as 1941. It was no secret that the Eustacia government sought to exterminate the entire Serbian, Jewish and Roma populations of Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. There was never any intention to deny or to hide this policy by the NDH government itself. In fact, the Eustacia documented the genocide with photographs and even film. Education minister in the NDH regime, Mile Budak, and we remember seeing the picture before, openly announced that the policy was to kill a third, deport a third, and forcefully convert a third of the Serbian population of Croatia and Bosnia. Convert to Roman Catholicism. Yeah? So, we are going to take a look at the picture of Budak again. As you remember, I showed him here. Mile Budak. Okay? So we have him right here in picture. Budak stated in 1941, quote, Thus our new Croatia will get rid of all Serbs in our midst in order to become 100% Catholic within 10 years. Unquote. A policy of mass murder and genocide was openly declared, not hidden, not secret, it was openly declared. In a speech made in Zagreb, NDH leader Poglavnik, Ante Pavelic, yeah, or Poglavnik, so this means Poglavnik stands for the leader, as I told you, Ante Pavelic stated, quote, A good Eustachy is one who can use his knife to cut a child from the womb of its mother. Unquote. Pope Pius XII defended Ante Pavelic as a much maligned man, and sent papal nuncio Giuseppe Ramiro Marcone to the NDH regime during World War II as his personal representative. Okay, Marcone. Just putting in the picture of Marcone again here. We have this other one. Here he is, and here he is too. This is Stepinac and Marcone together, these two. The Vatican did not de jure recognize the NDH state, but did send Giuseppe Ramiro Marcone as a delegate or emissary of the Holy See to the Zagreb Episcopali on August 5, 1941. Marcone was publicly seen and photographed with anti Pavelic and prominent Eustacia religious, political and military leaders. So you see him here with Aloysius Stepinac, and you see him here, Ante Pavelic in the center, with Vatican Nuncio, or Legate, I told you that he was a Nuncio of before, Ramiro Marcone on the left, yeah, the corpulent guy, and Vatican Secretary to the Nuncio Giuseppe Mazzucci at a ceremony at Zapretic, a town northwest of Zagreb, is what you see in this picture here. The Vatican did, however, de facto recognize the NDH, so they did not de jure recognize it, but they did de facto, and what that means I explained earlier in another reading of this book. The countries which recognized de jure the NDH, the satellite state of Croatia, legally, diplomatically and officially were Finland on the 2nd of July 1941, Hungary on the 10th of April 1941, Germany, Italy and Slovakia on April 15th 1941, Bulgaria on April 21st, 1941, Romania on May 6th, 1941, Japan on June 7th, 1941, Spain on June 27th, 1941, 
Japanese occupied China on July 5th, 1941, Denmark, July 10th, 1941, Japanese occupied Manchuria in China, Manchukuo on August 2nd, 1941. Japanese occupied Burma, Japanese occupied Philippines, the Free Indian Government and Thailand on April 27th, 1943. They all accepted the NDH state of Croatia de jure. Very important, de jure, not de facto, de jure. Vichy France did not de jure recognize the NDH state, but sent a trade representative, André Gaillard, to Zagreb. Vichy negotiated a trade agreement with the NDH on March 16, 1942, thus establishing de facto recognition. Switzerland established a trade agreement with the NDH on September 10, 1941, through trade representative Friedrich Kessli. The Vatican established immediate and direct diplomatic relations with the NDH Eustachia regime in 1941. What prevented the Vatican from legally recognizing its puppet and proxy NDH state was the potential backlash from the Allies, particularly Great Britain and the United States of America. The Vatican also had unofficial diplomatic relations with the NDH government through contacts with Croat representatives of the NDH regime Nikola Ruzinovic and Ervin Lopkovic. Quote, These arrangements were semi-secret, unquote. But March 1942, despite of the abundance of evidence pointing to mass killings, the Holy See was nevertheless drawing the Croatian representatives toward official relations. With Germany and Italy poised to win the war in 1942, the Vatican was moving closer to establishing official diplomatic, rela diplomatic relations with the NDH. Did the Vatican know of the mass murders and genocide being committed in the NDH? The three heads of the Vatican Secretariat of State, Domenico Tardini, Giovanni Battista Montini, who became later Antichrist Pope Paul VI, and Luigi Maglione knew of the atrocities in the NDH, but did nothing to stop them, remaining passive. Eugène Tisserand, a French cardinal prominent in the Vatican hierarchy, told Rosinovic on March 6, 1942, that he was aware of Croatian Roman Catholic clerical involvement in the mass murders. Quote, I know for a fact, not a theory, I know for a fact that it is the Franciscans themselves, as for example, Father Jekoslav Simic of Nin, who have taken part in attacks against the Orthodox populations so as to destroy the Orthodox Church. In the same way you destroyed the Orthodox Church in Banja Luka. I know for sure that the Franciscans in Bosnia and Herzegovina have acted abominably, and this pains me. Such acts should not be committed by educated, cultured, civilized people, let alone by priests." Unquote. In a meeting of May 27, 1942, Tisserand informed Rosinovic that based on German figures, 350,000 Serbs had disappeared in the NDH and that in one single concentration camp there are 20,000 Serbs. The full extent and nature of the genocide committed in the NDH was fully known by the Vatican by early 1942. The role and complicity of the Roman Catholic Church in Croatia and Bosnia in the genocide was also fully known. And yet, Eugenio Pacelli, Antichrist Pope Pius XII, did absolutely nothing. In fact, Pacelli was never anything but benevol uh, benevolent to the leaders and representatives of the Pavelic regime. As late as 1943, he expressed to Lobkovic, quote, his pleasure at the personal letter he had received from our Poglavnik our leader, 
unquote. And Ante Pavelic was Pacelli's Poglavnik or Führer in the NDH. Pacelli was not only Hitler's Pope, he was also Pavelic's Pope. Here we have another picture where you see Marconi. The Vatican Legate, Marconi, with Eustachio leader Ante Pavelic in the center. The Vatican Secretary, Giuseppe Masucci, who we saw in another picture already, is also here on the, uh, on the right hand. The Vatican de facto recognized the independent state of Croatia and established diplomatic relations. The objectives of the Eustachio regime were known by the Italian government and by the Vatican. Cornwell, the author of Hitler's Pope, the book that I showed to you here, um, Cornwell described the campaign of terror and extermination conducted by the Eustachy of Croatia against two million Serb Orthodox Christians that occurred in the Nazi puppet state of Greater Croatia, which included Bosnia-Herzegovina from 1941 through 1945. Here's a quote from his book. An act of ethnic cleansing before that hideous term came into vogue it was an attempt to create a pure Catholic Croatia by enforced conversions, deportations and mass extermination. So dreadful were the acts of torture and murder that even hardened German troops registered their horror. Pavelic's onslaught against the Orthodox Serbs remains one of the most appalling civilian massacres known to history." Unquote. What knowledge did the Vatican have of these atrocities? Could the Vatican have intervened to lessen or to stop them? What actions did the Vatican take after the war? Well, important questions, and only if you know the Bible you know that the Vatican, that the beast, is the instigator of all this on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church that rides the beast. Revelation 17. Here again we see in the a picture <coughs> NDH Ploglavnik, yeah, so Satellite State of Croatia leader Ante Pavelic on the left with the papal emissary Ramiro Marcon on the right. And here in another picture leaving the church. What did Pope Pius know about the Eustacia? In 1939 Pacelli had warmly endorsed Croat nationalism and confirmed the Eustachy perception of history. According to Cornwell, when in November 1939 Aloysius Stepinac came to Rome to meet with the Pope in an attempt to promote the canonization of Nicola Tavalek. Tavalek was a Croat martyr who had been killed in 1591 in Jerusalem and who was canonized by Pope VI in 1970. At that time, Pacelli reiterated a term that Pope Leo X had used to describe the Croats as, quote, the outpost of Christianity, unquote, meaning the outpost of Roman Catholicism. You see, I don't even need to comment on this anymore. It is already in there. The outpost of Christianity, meaning, of course, the outpost of Roman Catholicism. They were seen as a spearhead and as a bulwark against not only the Serbian and Greek Orthodox, but against the Russian Orthodox as well. The Croats were the Vatican's ramrod against the Orthodox. On the south they had Islam, they had Greece and Islam, and on the north and east they had Russia and the Serbs. They were the spearhead the Vatican's ramrod against the Orthodox that were surrounding them. Immediately after its inception, the NDH engaged in a policy of genocide. On April 25, 1941, the NDH promulgated legislation banning the Cyrillic script. So, that means the writing, because they're writing in Cyrillic. By June, Serbian Orthodox primary and preschools were shut down. In May, anti-Jewish laws were passed defining Jews in racial terms, prohibiting the marriage of Jews and Aryans, and sending Jews to the Croat concentration camp of Danica. The Croat Roman Catholic Church immediately sought to convert the Orthodox Serbs to Roman Catholicism. 
Official statements from the NDH government, however, showed that the policy was to be exclusion, deportation and extermination. Genocide rather than assimilation. Did the Vatican know of these objectives? Well, Cornwell again in his book, Hitler's Pope, wrote that the nature of the Eustachian regime was well known to the Vatican from the beginning. Okay? And um, I hope that this was an interesting reading to you because I will stop here and pick it up next time and we will read this in two parts, this being the first, next time being the second, and then we will continue in the secret history of the Jesuits, as we left off in page 151. But for the moment I think this is enough, because an hour has been reached and it was quite a very intense reading. I hope you enjoyed it and more I hope and pray that you understand that what we've read today is a confirmation that the Second World War was a religious war, was a counter-reformational war, was a war of the beast of Revelation 17, and the whore, the Catholic Church that rides it, against Jews, Orthodox, Gypsies, and Protestants. And that, in that, it was in full line with the objectives of Adolf Hitler of the Second World War, Adolf Hitler who also only was a puppet of the Jesuits, as we will see later on when we come to these readings, and we will understand that the Second World War was the continuation of the First World War. Remember that quote that I told you from uh, Marshal Fock? when he said in 1919 that this is not a peace treaty but a 20-year truce. This is the second 30 years war. The first was from 1618 to 1648 and killed 12 million or a little more and that's more than a third of the German population, Protestants in that time. And the Second World War, at least 66 million people got killed at least. And then we have to consider in the aftermath the killings of Stalin, the Orthodox about 15 million in Soviet Russia, and the killings of Mao Zedong in China, which estimates about 30 to 40, even 50 million people. Just incredible when you think about this. the secret history of the Jesuits. When you delve in there, you cannot stop anymore. Once you've tasted the real history, you want to know it all. At least that's the way it is with me. And that's why I'm sitting down here and reading these books and trying to explain these books and bring that closer to you. That for once you will get an education and that you will learn real history because, you know, remember the paper between the Lutheran and the Roman Catholic Church from conflict to communion. Our aim is not to sell, uh, to tell the story differently, uh, to tell a different story, but to tell the story differently. That was about the 500 years of Reformation and that is what they are doing with all historic teaching. They do not tell you the real history, but they tell it differently, so that always the Roman Catholic Church is in a good light, first and for all, and that even nobody makes the connection to religion in these wars. And that's what we have to learn and to take out from the reading of today. So I thank you very much for watching and listening and commenting. And until next time, the 20th reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. Until then, Jörg from Joggler66 says God bless you, signing off and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration.
of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and, and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.